1 John chapter number 3, and we'll begin reading in verse number 1. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, <clears throat> because it knew him not. Look over at chapter 4, in verse 10. Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Verse 19 will be our last verse. We love Him. Can you say amen right there? <clears throat> we love Him. <clears throat> now that's not an amazing thing. He's easy to love. Brother Foster did a wonderful job this morning just lifting up Jesus, the Lamb. Giving us plenty of reasons why we should love Him. But I do not understand the second part of this verse. Because He first loved us. I can't comprehend that. Brother Bob, I cannot wrap my mind around that. Why He would love me. Why, why He would love me even here 20 plus years after I've been saved and serving Him in the ministry. I, I, I don't know why He would love me, but why He would love me even before that when I was lost and undone without Christ. I, I don't understand that. But I sure am thankful for it. I'm glad there's a God in heaven tonight that has shown me great love. It's matchless love. I'm thankful for the love that He's shown in my life. Am I preaching to anybody tonight that is grateful that there's a God in heaven that loves you? The world does not understand this kind of love. Hollywood doesn't understand this kind of love. But I'm glad that I know about this love that John is writing about. We, we do understand tonight that the writer is John the Beloved. And really, when you think about it, who more qualified to write about the love of God than John the Beloved? In the Gospel of John, you find six times a form of the phrase, the disciple whom Jesus loved. Now, John didn't write those words with a high opinion of himself. He, he was not writing in arrogance. No, he was writing under divine inspiration of the Holy Ghost. He, he's writing down what God told him to pin down. Could you imagine you're sitting in your house and you're writing and you get to that part, the disciple whom Jesus... Yeah. Lord? Yeah. Yeah. Whoa, whoa, you talking about me? Yeah, yeah John, I'm, I'm talking about you. Yeah. Son, I don't know about you, but if I was John, I'd have to take a time out and make a few laps around the house for a little while. Hey, Amen. Hey the disciple whom Jesus loved. I think about the Last Supper. In John 13, Jesus announced to His disciples that one of them would betray Him. Ten of the disciples said, Lord, is it I? Am I the one? Judas said, Master, is it I? He never referred to Jesus as Lord. But then there was John, and the Bible said John was leaning upon the bosom of Christ. And when the Lord announced that one of the disciples would betray him, the Bible said in verse 25 of that chapter, John perked up and said, Lord, who is it? Yeah. Right. He knew it wasn't him. Right. While all the other ones are saying, is it I? John said, Lord, who is it? I mean, we'll just have a business meeting. We'll vote that sucker out right now. Yeah. You, you know why John knew it wasn't him? You know why his conscience was clear? Because he was closer than all the rest. Yeah, right. I want to be that close. Yeah, yeah. Brother and sister, do you realize you can be as close to the Lord as you want to be? Right. Amen, sir. You, you can be like Peter and talk a big talk. And then when things get tough, Peter got going. Yeah. Right. You can be like Thomas. Well, I'll believe as long as I can see the scars, as long as I can touch, as long as I can feel. You can be like Judas. Hang around Jesus most of your life. 
and still die and go straight to hell. I want to be like John. Close, leaning upon his bosom. A clear conscience. Then I think about in John 19, the Bible said, when Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, in John 19, Jesus is hanging on the cross of Calvary, suffering, taking my sin and your sin, taking the shame and the blame upon himself, hanging on the cross there that day. And he looked there and he saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved. And Brother Foster, I believe that it's that love right there, what John witnessed that day on the, on the hill of Calvary, I believe that's the love that he's writing about all these many years later as he writes in 1 John about the great love that God has shown to us. I do believe it's the love of Calvary's cross. John witnessed with his own eyes the greatest love that this whole world's ever known. What, would he, what we see through eyes of faith and in the Scriptures, John saw, and he wrote about it. I want to preach tonight for a few minutes on the love of Calvary's cross. Church, the only way that we'll ever love our Lord more is to at least try and understand just how much He loved us. Now John describes the love of Calvary's cross in three different ways. We'll look at them and go to the house. First of all, I want you to see the manner of Calvary's love. Look back at chapter number 3, where we, we, get, where we began earlier. Chapter 3 and... Verse number 1, John said, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us. We'll stop right there, but when I, when I think about this manner of love, it's really hard to describe it, but I can tell you what it's not. It's not of this world. Right, right. It's not a worldly love. It, it's not what Hollywood calls love, uh, what they call love, and what they're trying to pump into our living rooms through the television and the Internet. It ain't that love. And the world has a way of taking this thing of love and, and putting a perverted twist upon it and it's more lust than it is anything else. Uh, the, the secular music industry with their rock and roll songs and their country songs, uh, the, it ain't this manner of love, amen. Uh, the, the love wins crowd that we see so often now, it, it ain't this kind of love, amen. Its origin is not of humanity, but its origin is of heaven. It's a love that cannot be manufactured or mimicked by religion, although they've tried down through the years. But you, you cannot manufacture, you, you can't find this love by sitting in a confirmation class. Uh, you don't find this love by getting dunked in the baptistry. You don't find this love by joining up with the church. Uh, you don't find this kind of love in your good works and your good efforts. Uh, it's only found in Jesus and at the foot of Calvary's cross. Amen. Amen. Now John writes to us in verse 1 about the recognition of this love. He said, Behold, behold what manner of love. In, a, in other words, it's something we ought to think about. It's something we ought to focus on. It's something that ought to have our attention. As a matter of fact, it demands attention. Behold. But in 2021, there's not a lot of people, even God's people, that are giving attention to Calvary and the Christ of Calvary. Church, there's always been distractions for the people of God and from the work of God. But I tell you what, about a year ago, the distractions got ramped up. <laughs> I mean, you got pandemic going on. You got, I mean, politics like we've never seen it. No, I don't even want to get into all that tonight. But I'm just saying there are plenty of distractions in this day and hour. Could I encourage you tonight? Don't get caught up in the distractions. Amen. Don't get caught up in the politics and, and what the news is saying. You know what you need to do? Get in that book and read about what Jesus did for you on the cross of Calvary some 2,000 years ago. You keep your mind on that. 
that. Keep your heart on that. And even in the midst of pandemic and corrupt politics, you can still have joy. You can have peace. Amen. Your cup can be full to overflowing. You can have revival here this week if you'll give attention to what really matters. And that's the cross of Christ and the great love that He has shown. It demands attention. We're so busy on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and Marco Polo and, and all these other things and I'm not preaching against that tonight. I tell you what I am against though. I'm against spending all your time on that and giving no thought to your relationship with God. You're worried about what everybody posted that they had for lunch. Won't you read about what God posted for you today? It demands attention. It deserves appreciation. This is something we ought to appreciate. What Jesus did for us at Calvary, we ought to be thankful for that every day, every moment of our life. Because you'll find no greater love. I'm amazed. As I travel around the country, people say, what do you, what do you see as you travel in evangelism? And for whatever reason, Brother Foster, I don't know why God's been good to me. I don't know why I get to go the places I go, but we go north, south, east, west. We go all over the place. And I tell you what I see. I see some churches that are on fire for the Lord, but they're few and far between. And in my, it's just my opinion, y'all. I feel like I go to the right kind of churches. I go to the churches that are still standing on the King James Bible. Amen. Still getting up singing hymns. Yeah. Old-fashioned choir singing. I mean, that's the churches I go to. Yeah. And I'll be honest with you, more than half of them are dead as a doornail. Dry as cracker juice. They got their convictions. Now, I'm thankful for their convictions. But they don't really appreciate the goodness of God in their life. Our churches are getting quiet. They're getting cold. We're afraid somebody's going to label us a charismatic. I don't go to any independent Baptist churches that have any worries of being labeled a charismatic. I have not found that church yet. <laughs> well, I tell you what, though. As God's children... Every now and then it ought to just get all over us just how good God's been and, and the great love that He's shown in our life and how He's blessed us. Amen. It ought to come out through a shout. It ought to come out through a tear. It ought to come out through a trip to the altar. Maybe every now and then if you got the energy, jump up, make a lap around the church. Hallelujah. I don't care if they make fun of it. I don't care if they call us holy rollers. Amen. Hey, I'm glad. I'm glad I'm saved. Glad I'm washed in the blood. Glad I'm on my way to heaven. And it's all because of Christ and the cross of Calvary. Hallelujah. Bless His name. Hallelujah. I remember when I was a boy, we'd watch The Price is Right. Real spiritual show right there. And they, they, they'd call somebody's name. Y'all remember that? I mean, they'd call their name so-and-so. Come on down. And more than half the time, it'd be some lady in a pair of sweatpants and, and a, and a t-shirt with Mickey Mouse about five times too big. And here they'd come running down the aisle. Woo! Woo! Some of them would come down tears. I mean, they're just wiping the tears. They ain't won nothing, Brother Doug. All they did was got their name called. But can I say to you that if God ever called your name and you answered that call, you've already won. You already got it all. And we ought to appreciate that tonight. Hallelujah. We ought to appreciate that. The recognition of this love. Behold, you want to have revival this week? Get up in the morning. And instead of turning Fox on, Instead of turning the phone on, behold. Yeah. Hey man, that stuff can wait a few minutes. Yeah. Right, right. Behold. Yeah. But then I see the reaching of this love. He said, behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us. It's something that has been gifted. Yeah. Not something you work for. It's not something you buy. You can't do enough good works. You don't have enough money. You'll never have enough money to buy this love. But it's better than that. It's something that's gifted to us. 
And I want to say tonight that no one is beyond the reach of his affection. Not one person that's ever walked this earth was beyond the reach of his affection. Not all of them have accepted this gift. It might even be that not everybody in this building tonight has been a recipient of this gift. But he offers it. He offers it to you. You say, Brother Daniel, you don't know how bad I've been. You don't know the wicked things I've done. You don't know how far I've gone. Oh, yeah, but you don't understand just how much power there is in one drop of the precious blood of Jesus Christ. When I was a boy, I remember the old Henson family, they used to sing that song on the radio, said, that same Jesus you've heard of can take a black heart without love. He can wash it with red blood and make it whiter than snow. Why, he could do that for you tonight. He wants to do that for you tonight if you'll just trust him. But then I see the relationship of this love. He said in the middle of verse 1 that we should be called sons of God. There, there's a relationship that comes with this love. Now, now when I was born into this world, June the 9th, 1980, Little Rock, Arkansas, in the doctor's hospital. There was no discussion between my mom and dad what my last name was going to be. It was already determined. My dad's last name was Waters. His dad's last name was Waters and so on and so on. I was born into the Waters family. Now I'm sure there was some discussion about what my first name would be and I'm, I'm very thankful that they chose a normal name like Daniel. I, I'm happy with that tonight. I don't know all of y'all's names. Maybe you weren't so blessed. You might be one of those you're sitting here thinking like, yeah, I don't know what mom and dad were smoking when they gave me my name, but, <laughs> but they were way up in the clouds. <laughs> Almost 20 years ago, my wife, we stood on a stage kind of like this in a church, and she took my name. She wasn't born with, with the name Waters. She was born into the Minnick family. But on that day, she took the name Waters and she forevermore became Stormy Waters. And I'm thankful she was willing to take that name. I don't, I'm, I don't know if God blinded her to the fact that for the rest of her life she'd be called Stormy Waters, but I'm just glad she said, I'd do anyway. But I'm really glad tonight. More than the name Waters. More than the name Daniel. More than having a wife named Stormy Waters. I'm glad that there's a God in heaven that wanted to identify me as his own child. He's willing to identify me as his own child. I mean, on my good days, I am a son of God. But on my bad days, I'm still a son of God. When I get it all right, I'm a son of God. But when I fail and I get it all wrong, I'm still a child and a son of God. I thank God for that tonight. There's, there's a relationship that comes with this manner of Calvary's love. Number two tonight, I see the manifestation of Calvary's love. Back in chapter 4, look there if you would. Chapter 4 and verse number 9. I just want to thank the Lord that my voice is holding out tonight. May not have anything tomorrow, we'll see. But for right now, we're running all right. Chapter 4 and verse number 9. In this was manifested the love of God toward us. Because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him. In this was manifested the love of God toward us. Us. That word manifest, Webster defines it like this. He said it's clearly visible to the eye or obvious to the understanding, not obscure or difficult to be seen or understood. You know, this morning as Brother Foster took the Word of God and preached to us about the Lamb of God, and he talked about Calvary, he talked about the Passover, talked about the blood, talked about the empty tomb. You know, as he did such a marvelous job preaching this morning, it was very clear 
to see by faith what the Lord has done for us. God's love was manifested through His Son and through the cross of Calvary. As we look into the Old Testament, we, we see the types and we see the foreshadows and all those things. But I, I'm glad I, I'm not over there uh, where it was just types and, and foreshadows. I, I'm glad I was born on this side of Calvary where I can very clearly see what Jesus has done for me and the love that He's shown in my life. Romans 5, 8, Paul said, But God commendeth His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. By the way, brother and sister, God's love for sinners is never separated from the sacrifice of His Son. Anytime you find a verse in the New Testament Scripture that talks about God's love, it's going to be attached to a verse that also deals with the suffering of His Son. I'm thankful, I'm thankful tonight that God made His love for us known on Calvary. Just a little mustard seed of faith, and you can see that. Amen. Lastly tonight, I want to look at the movement of Calvary's love. Here in chapter 4, look at verse number 10. Here in His love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent his Son, to be the propitiation for our sins. Verse number 19, we, we love Him because we're so good and holy and sanctified and righteous. No, that ain't what it says, is it? Not unless you've got one of them funny Bibles. <laughs> but my King James Bible says we love Him because He first loved us. It's a love that moved towards us. God's love for humanity moved Him to step out of eternity and into time to demonstrate His love for lost sinners. It moved him to step away from that place of perfection and holiness and righteousness to condescend to this whole world of wickedness and ungodliness and perversion, but he did it so he could demonstrate just how much he loved us. It's love in action. It's both doing and done. You say, how, how can it be both doing and done, Brother Daniel? I'm glad you asked. But since you did, it made the sermon five minutes longer. <laughs> Calvary and what Jesus did for us there was a one-time thing. It, it had never happened before on that fashion and has never happened since. Matter of fact, he cried upon the cross of Calvary, it is finished. Salvation's plan was finalized. It was done. It, it was complete. Redemption's plan was done. It's a done deal. It'll never happen again. One of the arguments I've heard people make for people that believe you can lose your salvation is the fact that if you could to get saved again, Jesus Christ would have to climb back up on that cross and pay for your sins all over again and we know it doesn't work that way <coughs> he got it done once and you get saved you get saved one time amen once you're in you're in I don't know why this just crossed my mind but Jerry and Betty Monday they sang a song for years said the first word in the Bible is in and the last word in the Bible is amen I'm in amen <laughs> it's pretty good ain't it now, I'll go a little further than that. I'll tell you something else that is done. God's love for this world as a whole, it was a one-time thing. You, you study the New Testament of your Bible, every reference to God's love for this world is in the past tense. Now, go ahead, I'll, I'll give you a minute to pick your jaw up off the floor. I'll explain myself. It's past tense. 
There's a reason you need to understand that, church. Because there's a crowd out here that wants to pick and choose the parts of the Bible and Christianity that they like and the parts that they don't. <coughs> they say, well, I like this, but I don't like that. I want this, but I don't want that. They think, you know, well, I, I can live my life lost. I can live like a heathen. I can do all that I want to do, but it's God's just okay with me. Well, you need to read your Bible. God's not okay with you if that's how you're living your life. When I, when I go to the buffet, I'm like, I want some of that, but I don't want that. I like that. Put some of that on my plate, but I don't want that. Now, I don't know how y'all was raised. When I was raised in a home, mom fixed a meal, you ate what was on your plate. I never one time sat down at the supper table and said, ooh, I don't like that, I don't want that. Not one time did mom or dad ever get up and throw that in the trash and put a microwave pizza in the microwave or a corn dog or anything. We just didn't do that at my house. You ate what was on your plate. Now, here I am, 40 years old now. There's still things I don't like, Brother Jordan. So when I go to that buffet, I ain't going to put it on my plate. But now if you have me over your house and you fix a meal for me, I'm going to sit down at the supper table and I'm going to eat everything on my plate and I'm going to enjoy it. Even the parts that don't taste real good to me, I'm going to enjoy it. Just how I was raised. Now we got people in Christianity today I want that. I don't want that. I, I, want, I, I, I want the blessings of God, but now I don't want that obedience part. I, I want the goodness of God, but now don't talk about all this other stuff. I, I want to hear about I want to hear all about heaven, but now don't you say anything about hell. I want to hear about the love of God, but don't you talk to me about the judgment of God and the wrath of God and the chastening of God. I don't want to hear about that. Yeah. You're right. and that's the way you think tonight. You are shallow and you are immature. Right. Because as you grow, just like you grow physically and, 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 and in, your, in your maturity, as you grow, you start to appreciate things. Right. And even the things that maybe still don't taste good to you, you eat it. Because you know it's good for you whether it tastes good or not. We got a bunch of shallow Christians in our churches. Well, I like it when Brother Doug preaches on, you know, the Lamb of God like he did this morning. But now when he starts in on all that living a clean, separated life and living a holy life and he starts naming sin and he starts preaching on hell and, and a God that judges, that's, that's also a God of judgment. Well, I don't like that. If he keeps on doing that, I may go to the church up the road. Well, you better make reservations. That's all I got to say. <clears throat> you knew that was coming, didn't you? <laughs> hey, y'all, if it's in the book, we got to have it. We need it. I had, a, I had a young lady back in the fall. I was preaching in Bowie, Texas, and this young lady met me out in the foyer. I preached on hell that night. And she said, Brother Waters, how do you think a loving God could allow anybody to go to hell? I said, young lady, God sent the very best that heaven had to offer. And if you live your whole life and you reject the gift of Jesus Christ, when you, if you reject what God gave, when you leave this life and you stand before God at the white throne judgment, you will not be looking in the eyes of mercy. You will not be looking in the eyes of love. As he says, depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire. It's too late then. Listen, church, if you, want to know, if you want to know the love of God, now is the time. This is the time. Don't wait till it's too late. Talking about past tense, John 3, 16, one of the greatest verses on the love of God. But listen, for God so loved the world, past tense. We're in the King James Bible tonight. That he gave his only begotten son, past tense. But here's the glorious part. 
Watch how right in the middle of that verse it changes from past tense to present tense. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You know what happens? Uh, what was done some 2,000 years ago every time a lost sinner realizes they're on their way to hell and they need a Savior, they come to Jesus and they put their faith and repentance in Christ. You know what happens? What happened 2,000 years ago? It becomes active all over again it starts to move and all over again and you can still get saved God still offers the love that he showed on Calvary 2,000 years ago hallelujah it is both doing and done Lester Roloff was a well known preacher in the state of Texas I guess really all over the country but he was a Texas preacher and for many years he had homes for troubled young men and women that made a wreck of their life. And he'd take them men and women and boys and girls into his homes and show them the love of Christ. And the state of Texas did not like Brother Roloff. They, they tried to get him to take a license from the state of Texas. They wanted to run his homes. They didn't want to give any money to his homes. They didn't want to help him build his homes, but they, they wanted to tell him how to run his homes. He refused to do it. Now, for years, he would take them girls, he'd line them up in a choir like this at churches all over America, and he'd sing to them. He'd say, tell me, do you love Jesus? They'd sing back, oh, yes, I love Jesus. Well, they, they put Brother Roloff in jail for seven days in 1976 because he wouldn't take that license. He said, I'd rather go to jail for a week. Well, that day as he went to the jailhouse and they were going to put him in his jail cell, camera crews from all over Corpus Christi, Texas and around the state had gathered on the grounds there that day. But the staff from the homes and even some of the young ladies and men from the homes, they gathered there inside that jailhouse that day as they marched him off to his jail cell, you know what them girls started singing? Tell us, do you love Jesus? He whipped around with that Bible under his arm. Oh, yes, I love Jesus. Are you sure you love Jesus? Yes, I'm sure I love Jesus. Tell us why you love Jesus. This is why I love Jesus. Because He first loved me. And oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because He first loved me. The writer of that old hymn was not only writing about how much he loved Jesus, he was writing about how he could love Jesus. It's because the King of Glory made a move to this whole world, made a move toward you and me one day, made a move in our hearts and in our lives. And it's because of that that we can stand here tonight and proclaim, oh yes, oh yes, I love Jesus. Jesus. Because he first loved me. I'm just trying tonight to magnify the love of the Lord. I'm trying to tell you I'm glad he loves me. I'm glad he loves me when I'm good and he loves me when I'm bad. He loves me when I'm right and he loves me when I'm wrong. He loves me when I'm in and he loves me when I'm out. I just say thank God tonight. We're going to have revival. We need to fall in love with him all over again. And the only way we'll do that is to get a hold of how much he first loved us. I wonder tonight, do you really appreciate the love of God? If you do, if you say you do, won't you get rid of that little pet sin that's got you wrapped up so tight? Won't you get rid of that and embrace the love of Calvary's cross? If you really are thankful for that love tonight, won't you lay old self on the altar and get that old flesh and, and sin, whatever it may be, get it out of the way so that we can meet with God this week. I feel like, Brother Doug, we've gotten off to a good start in these services today. Matter of fact, we was getting in the, getting in the car this evening at the hotel. I said, I think that's the best Easter Sunday morning service we've been in in a long time. 
Because last year I was at the house watching a live stream service. <clears throat> it's been a good day. But we're just getting started. I could get up here tonight and we could preach on sin. We could talk about all kinds of things. And we got plenty of Bible to do it. But I just feel like if we could just get a hold of this tonight. And we would just really get a hold of what our Savior did for us on Calvary's cross and the love that He has shown. That ought to move us to forsake any sin that's got us bound up. It, it, it ought to move us to deny our flesh and crucify our flesh and get self out of the way. It ought to move us to worship Him. I'm thankful tonight for the love of Calvary's cross. Kyla Rowland wrote many songs. I, I guess one I've really fallen in love with lately is an, it's an older one. But it says, I started a journey many years ago looking for rest and peace for my soul. I found it at Calvary and truly I say it's satisfied then and gets better each day. I wonder tonight, have you accepted this love? If not, Sister Renee's coming to the piano to get us a song of invitation. If you need to be saved tonight, don't you find your way down here. You step out here and come. We'll take a Bible and show you how to have eternal life. Show you how to be saved. You can go to heaven when you die. Probably I'm preaching to mostly saved folks tonight. Let me ask you this. Do you really appreciate this love that God has shown in your life? If not, I'd ease down into this altar and say, Lord, thank you for your love and I just want to love you even more. Lord, bless the invitation time, I pray. Thank you for your love. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for Calvary and that precious redeeming blood. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you enjoyed today's broadcast, head on over to your app store and download the IBC Florence app today, where we have our music, sermons, videos, devotions, and much more. And as always, thanks for listening.